Well, hello friends. Welcome back to Browser Hacking. Today, we are gonna work on Discord again. And I found this pretty bad performance problem when I logged into Discord with my uh, with my main account because normally I've been testing Ladybird with a test account, but the test account doesn't have a lot of friends or direct messages going on. Um, so I never noticed this, but if I log in as myself, and actually let me put in my secret 2FA code, do not steal. Um, by the way, as you can see here, logging in actually works pretty well right now. Um, even with two-factor and everything, it's pretty cool. Right, so here is my home screen or friend screen or whatever. And uh, what I noticed was when you hover over these different accounts here uh, or the different DM conversations, it's just super sluggish and it's kind of strange because if you move slowly then the highlight kind of keeps up not really but it's it's less bad than if i start to move fast and then the highlight just takes forever to catch up to where i went and the status text here at the bottom keeps updating though so something is not going right um, and we have kind of the same problem here with the friends list uh, anyway, I thought this would be an interesting thing to analyze and work on in a video. So uh, here we are. Now, uh, in order to work on this, I don't want to have to restart the browser and go through the Discord login process over and over. So I'm just going to make a local copy of the page uh, from Firefox, where I am already logged in, apparently. So let's just save and... Yeah, sometimes it gives you this thing because one out of 47 resources could not be downloaded, but that's probably fine. Um, all right, and then let's test the local... Uh, wait, what the hell was it called? <laughs> um, bullet Discord Friends. Well, I don't know how to type that, so um, let's just call it friends.html. Sweet, and yeah, there we go. So that's obviously easier than uh, doing the login process every time. And okay, so uh, let's uh, get a profile. And for that, we are going to uh, apply my trusty um, call grind patch for Ladybird which actually changed a little bit since last time, but here it is in its entirety, if you need it. <laughs> um, I should really make this part of the app, but I keep not doing it for whatever reason. Okay, so we rebuild with that, and all it does is that it will start the web content rendering process in a um, in a mode where it's run through the Valgrind or call grind specifically uh, profiler. And then I can enable profiling with the call grind control command when I feel like it would be an interesting time to start doing that. So I'm going to turn instrumentation on here after everything loads. And yeah, with call grind um, hosting the process, it is significantly slower. As you can see, very, very slow, actually. I'm still waiting for Linus to light up. Um, be nice if he did. Although, at the same time, I suppose it's not... Yeah, there we go. Okay, so now we are instrumenting, and I guess I'm just going to move around a little bit like that. And maybe we can look at top to see. Yeah, we see Colgrind is just working its butt off to accommodate um, all of those wild movements I just made. And nothing happening visually. Uh, still Lena's highlighted. My cursor has long since left the window. There we got a status bar update. Yeah, so bunch of work being done here. Probably layout. Doesn't look like painting because we're not seeing any new states um, painted. Um, might be hit testing, but guessing is silly when we can also just look at the profile and um, maybe we have enough 
data at that point. I'm just going to turn it off. And then we will look at it in Cash Grind. OK. So let's go to the top here and see what do we see. We see near the top 99.6% in update layout. OK, so we are doing a lot of layout work. And yeah, the, the call graph here. Uh, how many layouts do we actually have? We have 65 calls to layout from handle mouse move. So essentially, the way mouse move works is that um, if the page is already laid out, then we can easily just figure out what is the mouse over. But if the page has um, an invalid layout because something happened um, that invalidated the layout, like um, maybe the the dimensions of an element changed or some JavaScript ran and inserted something or whatever, layout is invalid for some reason. When you mouse move and we want to figure out what you're mousing over, we have to make sure the layout is up to date. So uh, seems like that is where all of the time all of the CPU crunch is coming from mouse move leading to a layout. And here, if you look at what layout actually ends up spending time on building the layout tree, less than 10%, update style about 5%, and then doing the actual layout work, 85%. So um, this feels very, very layout heavy. And Let's see, it would be interesting to find out. Um, let's look at layout viewport. This is the sort of the first layout function or the, the root level layout function that gets called because the viewport is always the root of the layout tree. Um, OK, so layout viewport. And then where is all the time getting spent? OK, so down here. Um, here we can actually see, wait, am I reading this right? 189,000 calls in a flex formatting context. Fle oh yeah, we can see it here too. There's 189,000 calls to flex formatting context run, which means that we run the flex layout algorithm 189,000 times in, in the <laughs> time I spent mousing around there. Um, I wonder if that's good. That seems like excessive, even for that page. Um, so let's see, let's, um, we start by, let's start by getting rid of the changes that I got for, that I inserted for the profile, because we can, we can probably look at this for now. And I want to uh, log just how long one of these layouts takes in practice, because call grind is great at identifying what path the program is taking through the various uh, calls and everything, and it counts everything meticulously. So you know exactly how many times things are called. But what call grind is not super great at is uh, mapping directly to wall time, if that makes sense, uh, because it is an emulating profiler. Um, it is sometimes not entirely in touch with reality when it comes to time spent. So um, because of the immense slowdown, and it can only um, estimate basically what how much time would really be spent. So what we're going to do is we're going to just make a timer here. Um, just start new. I don't know why I called it timer. And then at the end of layout here, um, document update layout, or you know what, let's just say layout, and then how much time was spent? Timer elapsed. So that will be in milliseconds. And that should give us sort of a, a clue of how much time each layout takes. Um, okay, so what are we looking at here? 150 something. Yeah, so like 150 milliseconds thereabouts, sometimes worse. And if I move around a lot, then yeah, 
we can see here, it just continues doing those queued up layouts, which is not great. Um, definitely not pleasant to look at. Okay, so feels like there are multiple issues here. Um, one, that I mean, the most obvious one being that layout is slow, but um, it's also like kind of stupid in that we allow ourselves to queue up a bunch of um, sort of sequential layouts without uh, doing any visual update in between. Because I feel like if we did a visual update in between these layouts, it would look, I mean, it would still look laggy, but at least you would see uh, something change uh, instead of like the way it is right now, where the page kind of remains static after you do this. And then you have to wait for this long train of layouts to actually finish before, yeah, before you see that visual update. Mm. Uh, even after I close the browser, it keeps doing layouts in the background. That's a little bit concerning. We should probably, the web content process should probably die when you do that, but we don't have a mechanism that actually nukes it until it finishes. All right, so where do we go first? Well, there's a lot of flex layout going on. So I am 99% sure that we don't need to do all of that flex layout. Um, and we're probably just doing something stupid. So let's see, I find these cycles a little bit confusing sometimes. I'm just gonna turn off cycle detection here which screws up the numbers a lot and makes the <laughs> call graph a little bit harder to understand, but you can see who is calling um, flex formatting context run. Um, oh my goodness, this is, are they being called in both directions? Oh, that's just dandy. <laughs> uh, wow, what a spider web. Okay, so who's calling flex formatting context run? Can I see a caller? All callers. Maybe that's what I wanted to see. All callers of flex formatting context run. Um, wait, this is so confusing. Layout inside. Right, so we have nested layouts which is, I mean, that's obviously always the case on the web. You have a bunch of nested layout things. Um, but why do we do so many flex layouts? Uh, let's see, let's, let's make a test page. Um, and I'll just make a simple display flex. And maybe we'll have one for the items. Although I don't know what I would put in the item. Uh, maybe we nest it a little bit. Uh, nested three levels, let's say. And then we put some items here. Uh huh. And why not one more? Three. Okay, so if we look at this, which, uh, oh, I, <laughs> I used the wrong class name. I was like, why is it vertical? Um, flex, and let's do this for good measure. My favorite um, CSS debugging trick, solid black. Okay, yeah, that's more like it. So, this is very fast, but I wonder how many times do we actually run these flex layouts in a situation like this? Because in the past, at least, I've seen some seriously recursive call stacks. Um, and I always, I always think to myself, oh, I bet we're doing something stupid and just redoing the same flex layout over and over. But I never actually looked into it. Um, so what are you doing? Let's just print out here. Like how many times do we run one of these? Uh, flex formatting context and 
we'll say the name of the flex container we're laying out and the available space um, container available space. Yeah, that's fine. Flex container debug description and the available content space. Sure. Oh my goodness. Okay. So let's see, we had three levels um, of, I should really name those better. Makes it a little hard to understand which one is which if they're all called div.flex. So we'll do this. You can have numeric classes, right? So do that. And we'll call these like item one, item two and item three. All right. Okay, so here's the end of a layout, I guess. So this is one layout. And yeah, so it starts with the outer one flex.1, flex.2, flex.3. And we're doing um, intrinsic sizing layout here, as you can see, because we have a max content constraint on the container. So we're trying to figure out like how large is the max content width um, of the flex.2 container or whatever. Uh, okay, okay, okay. And the neat thing about intrinsic size layout, by the way, is that uh, when you're doing that, all you really need to find out is how large is the uh, flex container. You don't need to figure out like how large are the things inside of it, other than uh, figuring out, well, well, whatever you need to do to figure out like how large are the flex items, but you don't need to do full layout of the flex items um, when you're only interested in the intrinsic size of the container. So for example, if you have flex items with specific size, so like width 100px, height 100px, um, in cases like that, you should be able to bypass um, or avoid doing any kind of internal layout inside flex items. Um, anyways, let's see. So a lot of, so these are the sizes we end up with, I guess, like 32 by 21, something or other. Right. That's the, the containers. And then the items, where are the items? Oh, the items are not flex formatting contexts, of course. Um, right. But we're doing the same one multiple times. Yeah, so this is kind of what I was suspecting, but I never really confirmed it. So yeah, as you can see here, like flex.3, we lay it out once here with these dimensions of available content space. And then we do it again here, same exact available space. Then again here, same exact available space. And again here. And um, if you're laying out the same box, like the same flex container, the same exact flex container within the same layout um, pass with the same exact amount of available space and the same constraints, you'll get the same result, which tells me that we're doing this same layout over and over. Um, which is not good. We could probably just not do that. So why are we doing them though? Um, so I bet you that when we are doing inside layout, layout inside, um, this is at the very end of the flex layout algorithm. So we've like figured out the size of all the flex items. And now the only thing that remains is to lay out the inside of all the boxes which as I was saying, we don't need to do for intrinsic sizing layout. And here, oh, I see. <laughs> so this is actually really simple. Um, I think it is really simple because uh, the very last thing that we do is that we check if, if this, um, if the available width or height for the flex container is an intrinsic sizing constraint, that means that we are 
that means that we are doing an intrinsic sizing layout uh, and we're only interested in the intrinsic size of the flex container at this point. Um, so we didn't need to do this work that we just did laying out the inside of flex items if we are an intrinsic size layout. Um, so I bet you we can just copy this into the else branch here and do it there because it shouldn't matter. And what does this comment say? Our caller is only interested in the content width and content height results, which have now been set on mflux container state. So there is no need to continue the main layout algorithm at this point. But the layout algorithm, <laughs> but the layout algorithm ends here. I think this was um, this chunk was earlier in the function before, where the and, and then we had like an early return here. Um, but then it was moved to the end of the function, but the comment saying that basically the comment explaining the early return was kept which makes no sense, so let's nuke that. Um, let's see. Do not use else after return. Okay, I don't have a return. Okay, so uh, here, let's say like, um, this is a normal layout. Um, so let's say this is a normal layout. Finally, this is a normal layout, not intrinsic sizing. Right. So if I do that, maybe a little bit of that, just because. Um, or no, let me let me be. I don't want to make arbitrary changes, even though. Okay. Yeah, if I only do that, does that affect? So the result is the same, but now how many times do I do flex.3? Yeah, I only do it the one time with the final dimensions here. Right. So I think what was happening was that we were just doing, um, we computing the intrinsic size of each of the nested flex containers. Um, so if we look at that in Firefox dev tools, you'll see like we have these nested flex containers, right? And when computing the intrinsic size of each one, uh, we would recurse, I think we would recurse through all of the um, all of its subtree and then lay out everything inside of it, essentially. And Once you know the size of this guy, it's not going to change depending on if you're starting from here or here or here. Um, size of this guy is always going to be the same. And you don't need to lay out the inside of flex.3 every time. Hmm. Yeah. I believe this makes sense. Let's see. Let me run, run the uh, run the layout tests. I think this should be fine. Okay, and uh, let's test it on our friends page. Okay. Well, <laughs> all of this noise is very noisy. So let's. Get rid of that. Okay, that's already a huge improvement, right? So we went from 150 milliseconds per layout to under 50 for most of them, which is really nice. And it is definitely more responsive. Although, yeah, if I start to move around too much, then the problem is still visible. Um, but this is excellent. This is excellent progress already. So yeah, I think that's just totally unnecessary work laying out the inside of each item during intrinsic sizing of the flex containers. So let's commit that. Um, pump 
bam bam live web don't lay out inside of flex items during uh when during intrinsic sizing um let's see avoid inside layout of flex items during intrinsic sizing yeah when we're only interested in when we're calculating the intrinsic size of a flex container we don't need we don't have to or need to um, lay out the inside of each flex item that's only necessary if that um, if the flex items are going to be seen. This avoids a, um, as is the case for normal layout. Um, let's see, will be seen as is the case for normal layout. All right. Bunch, a whole bunch of unnecessary uh, layout work on a, on on pages that use Flexbox layout. Yes, that is a dramatic improvement, and I believe it to be sound. So, what do we do about this though? Because I still, I want this to be faster. Let me log when we're painting, because let's see, that will be paint all phases. Uh, let's make a timer here and see how long paints take. Uh, core, elapsed timer, start new. Um, paint. Simple enough. Okay. So, oh, paints are quite fast. It's like five milliseconds. That's good. And okay, yeah. So exactly, if we if we just hover around like that, it just queues up a whole bunch of layouts, right? And then it just keeps grinding through all that layout work before finally deciding to paint. Hmm. So I guess there are so many different approaches to this. Thinking like what would be the easiest um, sort of least invasive way to get a responsiveness improvement right now? Because you know you can you can think ahead in terms of architecture. And in the future, I want us to get to a point where um, there are sort of shared, there's shared memory textures that um, are coordinated between the um, UI browser process and the web content rendering process where, you know, the, the web content rendering process can draw into a shared memory texture and then um, or just send some signal across to the to the UI process and say like, oh, this uh, texture is updated or whatever, and it can be reflected on screen. Uh, but at the moment, what we have is um, more of a um, sequential command uh, request response type architecture where um, like I move the mouse here and that generates a message from the UI process to the web content process saying like, hey, the mouse moved to this location. And um, as I recall, when that results in a visual change, then the web content process sends a message to the UI process saying like, hey, there's a visual change um, that I could repaint, I could paint for you. Um, when you're ready to paint, just let me know. And because of that, I think because the web content process will not paint on its own. Like it's not gonna decide to start painting. It will wait for the UI process to tell it to start painting. And because of that, um, it's possible for a whole bunch of mouse move 
events to sort of get backed up, right? Get get queued up. Um, and even if the web content process sends a message to the UI process saying like, hey, I'd like you, I, I'm ready to paint. And the UI process reacts to that by asking the web content process to paint. The request to paint will still be queued up behind all of these pending mouse moves. Um, I hope that makes sense. So let's see. So the mouse moves, we could probably coalesce. Um, if you have, like, if, if the last event that happened was a mouse move, and then another event happens, and it's also a mouse move, so that, like you have three events in a row and they're all mouse moves, you only need to react to the last one, I think. Um, you could save a lot of processing time by only reacting to the last one. If you're if you're backed up, right? Like if you have a ton of events that you need to process, you have a bunch of mouse moves in a row, just coalesce them into a single mouse move. Uh, as long as you're not coalescing across other event types, so you don't like coalesce across a, a mouse down or a key down or something like that, uh, any user input event that isn't a uh, mouse move, I think you would need to process in order always. Um, you can't coalesce those. I think. At least, yeah. Yeah. So, uh, how would we do that? Um, I guess on the um, web content process side, uh, client. Uh, connection from client. So we have a connection from the client. The client in this case is the browser UI process. And I think, let's see, so here are all the different uh, sort of user input events. They will come in here through the IPC layer and event, uh, essentially tell the web engine, hey, there's a mouse down at this position. And um, the web engine will respond saying like, oh, that was handled or not handled. And then we asynchronously report back to the UI process that the input event was handled. Uh, yeah. Let's see. So, hmm. I think I'm just thinking like how does this asynchronous report back mechanism work? It works by just sending a thing back, did finish handling input event. And then Oh right, so this is um Sam did this, I think. It's like if you have um keyboard shortcut that means something to the browser, um, then the browser will still still let the web page get a chance to uh, react to the input before um, checking if it should be interpreted as a sh keyboard shortcut. I think it's for that. Anyway, uh, let's see how we would coalesce these things. But I think it makes sense to coalesce them on the web content process side, I think. Um, because if we try to coalesce them in the UI process, then we might just end up with a bit of lag, right? Because then what are we going to do? Like, um, wait, do like, like the TCP Nagel's algorithm or whatever, where you wait a little bit before you send mouse events, that wouldn't be a good experience. Um, Okay, so I think what we're gonna do is we're gonna we're gonna make a little queue of pending input events. So um, we'll say something like mouse event or like yeah, queued mouse event or something like that. Um, and we can also have a queued key key event. 
keyboard event, let's call it. And then this one needs to have the same. We're just gonna like stash away this information basically. So we take that and put it here. Okay. And oh, let's call those U32 maybe. Because that's what we intend. Or let's be good boys and just do that. Don't have to don't have to screw around. Um, and for the keys, we need uh, key modifiers and code point. Yeah, so it's a little bit old style keyboard events here. Not handling multi code point keys, which are most likely a thing that we need to care about at some point, but not today. Um, okay, and then I want to have a queue of a variant of these two. Uh, no, not a variant of mouse event twice. Um, input event, queued input events. Well, cool. Does that build? It seems to not build. Why does that not build? Mm, no template named Q. Okay, well, that, <laughs> that's straightforward. Okay, and let me go ahead and bump the copyright date while we're here. Since we're going to be doing a bunch of work. Okay, so mouse down. So what we want to do here now is we want to um, we want to queue up an event rather than um, rather than calling the thing right away. So we're going to do this queued mouse event. And then we just stash all the information here. Buttons and modifiers, right? Cool, and then I guess we need to actually have a timer of some description to um, drive the dequeuing or the flushing of this queue. Um, input event um, flush timer or something, something like that. Um, yeah, well, whatever. And then maybe we're not, we're not gonna flush the events, actually, we're gonna process them. Uh, input event queue. Processing. Ah, that's a bit serious. Um, queued input events. Do I want to call that input event queue instead? At least then we have symmetry with these two. All right, important details here. Um, and then input event queue processing timer, which we could just call the input event queue timer, actually. But we're going to basically just um, start it here. And we need to create it. Let's do it in the constructor for simplicity, which oh, it's right next to a, <laughs> the paint flush timer. Um, so paints are already doing kind of a similar thing, actually. So this will be cool. Although in that case, we are flushing here. We're not gonna not gonna flush. Um, why am I doing so many things? What do I want to call? Process? What did I call it? I didn't call it anything. I never added a function for it. Um, Process input event queue. Yeah, exciting. Okay, so that's cool. Okay, so what does that function do then? Connection from client. Process input event queue. Um, 
Well, if the input event queue is empty, then there's nothing to do. Right. And then let's see, I guess the easiest approach would be to just take, um, take an item from the queue. So event is input event queue DQ. Um, and then that's going to be a variant. So we need to visit. Um, let's see. So we visit if it's a um, queued mouse event. Then switch event dot type, which I never added anything for that. It just seemed like something I would have added. So enum class type. Are you a uh, mouse move? A mouse down, perhaps? Per chance, a mouse up? There's some other ones. Mouse wheel and double click. All right, so let's have those as well. Uh, mouse wheel and double click. I bet you we need more for the wheel. Yeah, we need two more integers for that one. Those are called wheel delta x and y. Right. So, oops, I guess we can just add those here. Wheel delta x. Y. And you know what? Let's also do this. Okay, and for this fella, it also needs a type, but your types are key down, possibly key up. I don't think we have any other ones at this present moment. Type, 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 type. Okay, so here we needed to say this was a type mouse down. All right. And now, can I switch on that? Yes, I can. Okay, so case mouse down. Then I should do what this fellow is doing right here. Aha. But all of the things come from the event rather than being uh, function parameters because we queued those up. Okay, so that's actually pretty straightforward. And we just need to do this a bunch of times for the different types of events. Mouse down, mouse up, mouse move. Um, mouse move, I think. All of these fellas have the same same layout except the wheel. So we'll do that one last. Handle doubly click. Wait, mouse move did not have modifiers. Mouse move wants only buttons and modifiers. Okay. No button for you. I guess yeah, you don't uh, a mouse move event does not have a button. It's just a move. Makes sense. And then the wheel event dot wheel delta x event dot wheel delta y. Very cool. Very cool. All right. Um, bum, 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 bum. And then we need to visit the other type as well, which would be the um, queued keyboard event. Um, and again, switch on the type of that one. Key down. Um, key down. Again, just copying what the existing code does. And then taking those from the event. And that's cool. Key up. Okay, so now we have our very own queue of these events. And we have a function that takes one thing from the queue 
And then I'm thinking if there are any more events in the queue, uh, if it's not empty, we will schedule the timer again. If we do that, then let's see. So what will happen is that we'll schedule this. We'll events come in, we schedule the processing, we handle one event, if there are more events, we schedule another round. And if a paint request comes in, in between, it will now get handled um, before this timer runs again, because the um, scheduling this timer doesn't put it before everything else. So if there's a pending paint request, it will now be processed in between processing these events. That kind of makes sense to me. Okay, so I'm just going to add these. Mouse move. These are all very straightforward, although that one didn't have button. Oh, <laughs> mouse move has button here for some reason. I guess I'll just put it in the um, cute event, even though it's ignored later on. Whatever. Um, mouse up. Mouse wheel. Let's make sure we remember to wheel delta x and wheel delta y. All right. And finally, the double click, which is fun to say for some reason. Key down. That's going to look a little bit different. Not too different, I guess. Um, just queued keyboard event key down and then just different things here queued keyboard event um, key is key modifiers is modifiers oh I already had modifiers and code point is code a point clickety clack and key up finally what about that? So we're actually not coalescing anything yet, but we are allowing um, paint requests to be processed in between events. If I if I got this right, um, yeah. <laughs> so now, as you can see. It no longer gets stuck. You can sort of see all those layouts play out after I stop moving the mouse. I just move the mouse away and it keeps updating because we process paint requests in between input events, which I would say this is slightly nicer than what we had before. It's not great because the lag is obviously like this is stupid and ugly, but it still somehow feels better than the UI completely freezing, right? At least I see that it's doing something. It's like working hard to catch up with my radical mouse movements. Um, also, I should have made this into a helper, I guess. Let's make a helper. And Q input event. Um, we'll do something like that. And Let's see. Tuck, 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 tuck. Connection from client on queue. And C line really likes to qualify things when uh, auto completing these, which I don't love. Don't need that much qualification here. So uh, input event queue and queue. So I wanted to do that and then start the timer because then these can just be an Q input event like that. And it's slightly nicer, I would say. At least we are we don't have to touch the timer in every function. Uh, dang it. It's a little bit nicer factoring. It is a little bit. Tap, tap, tap. 
almost done. Oh, wait, hold on. Almost there. That's pretty good. Now I'm thinking if we have more events in the queue, but there aren't any paint requests pending, I guess we could just process the next event right away, right? Hmm. We don't need to restart the timer. Hmm. Let's see. So I guess I can do that with uh, let's make a helper function process one input event. Um, process one input event, yeah. And then we will put this stuff in there. So connection from client process one input event. Um, let's see process one input event, blah, blah, blah. Okay, so while the input event at Q is not empty, well, I always want to process one. So maybe do process one. And then while input event Q, um, well, it's not empty and pending paint requests is empty, right? And we still have to do this because if there are no input events, we should do nothing. But if there are input events, we will keep processing one while we have some and there are no paint requests. So let's see how many can we actually process here? Let's see processed just out of curiosity, processed hmm, input events. See if this, this should allow us to handle more events as long as they don't cause a paint request to occur. Hmm, although, I wonder if this will actually be better or if this will cause them to batch up again, now that I think about it because the paint request only comes in. Yeah, <laughs> this brings the problem back because the paint requests only come in from the UI process once it gets a chance to, once it reacts to us sending the invalidation over. So this actually brings back the problem. All right, so let's undo that. Um, go back to the way things were. It was fine the way it was. All right, and there we are. Just make sure that I restored it correctly. But yeah, I think this is nicer, or it's not optimal, obviously, but it is better, definitely. Um, let me commit this. Okay, so web content. Um, Q process. Uh, 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 let's see. Um, give paint requests. Process paint requests that occur between input events. Let's see. What do we call this? Um, process uh, input events uh, in a. Um, Give, give paint requests a chance to happen between input events. 
Um, let's see. Okay, so before this patch, we had an issue where um, the web content process could get uh, backed up with tons of pending uh, input events, especially mouse move. Uh, and have to work through all of those before um, responding to a paint request from the UI process. This uh, led to a situation where this could lead to a uh, situation where uh, we went for a very long time without seeing any visual updates. Um, the approach I've taken here is pretty simple. We basically make a queue of all incoming input events on the web content process side and then process that queue one event at a time using a zero timer. This is basic, but it allows paint requests to come in between the input event and we do now get more frequent visual updates, even during a heavy pressure from input events. All right, so then what I wanted to do was to do um, coalesce the mouse moves. Um, so how would we do that? Um, let's see. I guess here I just need to check if the the last thing in the queue is also a mouse cute mouse event so if um pending or oh, the input event queue last tail there's no api there's head oh there's just no tail let's just add it um Oh, what's the layout of this thing again? An intrusive list of segments. Each segment has a vector of T's and that's it. Okay, so that would just be, let's see what NQ does. Just appends to the last segment data, right? So segments.last.data. Last. Wait, does that make sense? Segments, oh, segments is um, intrusive list. Does that have last? I think it does. Let's see, Q tail. If the Q tail is a queued mouse event, Wait, why doesn't that work? Uh, oh, it's a pointer. Right, right, right. Uh, sorry, I have to... Um, do this. Thank you. And then I can't call tail indiscriminately. I have to check if the queue is empty. So it has to be non-empty. And the tail has to be a queued mouse event. And the tail queued mouse event has to be a uh, mouse move. If all of that is the case, then we can just replace it, right? Yeah, we should just replace it if that happens. So um input event q dot tail um q 
can do can we just do that? Okay, so I'll maybe I'll put this here. Okay. Optimization coalesce with um, previous event if if previous event uh, is previous unprocessed if the previous event is also a mouse move. And oh, that's a big rebuild because I touched q.h. Actually, maybe not a huge rebuild. <laughs> I'll have to rebuild a little bit. Um, let me run that with j20 just so I don't screw up the recording. Hmm, so this feels reasonable. So essentially, if there are, if there's already a mouse move event queued up that we haven't processed yet, um, and another mouse move event comes in, we just replace the event, the last event in queue. Um, I think that is sound. I guess the cases I'm thinking of is like, if you have a web app that wants like really fine mouse events, like it expects, like if you have a, um, a drawing painting application or something like that, and it wants fine mouse events, we will mess that up a little bit. Um, but at the same time, like an application like that would probably be smart enough not to trigger layout every time that you move the mouse. I say optimistically, I don't know. I don't know. Maybe, maybe there are um, complex cases like that, that we need to be more sophisticated about. But I think right now, um, there's a lot of value that we can get for like the vastly common cases by doing less um, layout work in response to mouse moves, if we can. Um, I say optimistically hoping that this actually works out, <laughs> that it actually makes a noticeable difference, but it feels like it should because yeah, like all of those mouse moves, like all of those queued up layouts that you see, um, you should be able to to collapse them into a, to a single layout, uh, coalesce them into a single layout, because while that layout is happening, um, more events will come in. And while we're processing the queue of events, we'll just like chop out um, multiple sequential mouse moves. Yeah, yeah, I think it's gonna work. I've psyched myself up now that it's gonna work. <laughs> um, let's see, almost there. Come on. I'm ready. Oh, where is it? Here. Oh, crash. <laughs> <laughs> Dang it. Um, shoot, what did I do? I called tail. Wait, if the input event queue is non empty, and then I call tail. Oh, wait, assertion is empty. I wrote the assertion wrong. Oh, dang it. <laughs> I have to rebuild everything. Oh, that's a bit frustrating. Um,. Okay, that was stupid. Okay, well, um, what else is going on here in this profile anyway? I haven't looked at it since we started. Um, yeah, there's all that layout work. So we got rid of most of, or much of it, or two thirds of it, I guess. We went from 150 to 50 milliseconds roughly per 
layout totally. So that's excellent. I always see this one, see this one a lot. Text is editable. I think we compute the editability, editability of text nodes in a pretty stupid way. Like we have to um, traverse the ancestors to see if somebody has a content editable attribute. And we do that traversal like over and over and over. Could probably cache that and then well, you know, when, whenever you're caching any kind of information, the, the hard part is always invalidating correctly. Uh, so you would need to invalidate the editability state on text nodes when somebody in their ancestor chain changes content editable state. That's a little bit of a thing. Oh, it's already finished. Cool. Um, wait, no, it was not. Ah, oh, dang it. <laughs> I thought it was finished. I was looking in the wrong window. Um, yeah, so that that would be one thing that we could improve. Although it might be much less than 5.8% since this is before the layout uh, work reduction. Glyph or emoji width. Yeah, text measurement is text measurement is obviously always going to be um, a like a large bulk of the work in web page layout. Um, even in an optim optimized, heavily optimized engine like WebKit, um, a lot of time in layout is spent measuring text. Like how wide is this word? Um, on many web pages for WebKit, I know it's the, the, the single most um, heavy thing that layout has to do. All right, come on now. Come on. See the CPU graph down here trailing off. Getting ready for the link. Uh -huh. Okay. Come on. Yes. It seems to kind of work. Yeah. So like I can aggressively move around and I stop on Linus. And yeah, it snaps right there. Instead of carrying, instead of like getting backed up with all those pending mouse moves, we have coalesced them into a single one. And it's not perfectly lag free. Like it does lag behind the cursor a little bit, but so much less. This is really sweet, actually. Oh my goodness, this is <laughs> this is so responsive compared to where we started today. Um, that's really awesome. And yeah, we have a lot more paints now, as you can see, by the way, when we started, we had like layout, 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 paint, layout, 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 paint. And now it's more like layout, uh, pa -pa 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 paint, layout, pa -pa paint, pa paint. Maybe we're painting a little too much. Um, but I will leave figuring that out for another day. Um, Still, painting too much, at least then we have visually up to date, a visually up to date browser, which feels nice. So I do like that. And, uh, oh man, this is so cool. <laughs> it's so nice how it, it just feels so snappy compared to before. Ah, um, you know what? Let's, let's get a profile of where we ended up also. Or wait, I should do a commit here. Commit the queue change first. So just adding that tail function. Um, we already had head, so let's also have tail. And then let's see, connection from client. Hmm. I think actually, Hmm, this just got me thinking about one thing. I think um, the um, if we're coalescing the events, I think the browser will expect us to send the same number of acknowledgments as we received events. That's that report finished handling input event thing. Yeah, I think we have 
it expects to, us to send as many because it will... Let's see what it does with these. The finish handling input event, right? So here, pending input events. It has a queue of them. Yeah, so we don't want this to... <laughs> this is... Uh, it looks very similar to the code I just wrote um, by Sam. Look at that. Oh, man. His name, process next input event, that's slightly better than mine. Um, what did I call it? Process input event queue. Yeah, we'll call it process next input event. That's better, clearly better. Um, process next input event. Shout outs to Sam for the superior name there. Um, let me get that into my preceding commit. Um, or actually into this one. <sighs> All right, let's see. Input process next input event. You come with me. Okay. Builds fine. Okay, so get commit fix up. Let's fix that up. Right, nice. Okay. Back we are. Okay, okay. So, right, what I wanted to do was to make sure that we send as many acknowledgements as we receive events. So, in order for that to work, um, I think the hackiest, simplest way to solve that, I guess, is to just have a number that says how many coalescings occurred, how many coalescations. How many koalas? Um, how many koalas we did for the um, koalas? Ko ko koala? Koalas? Koalas um, event count. Yeah, so that will be um, zero normally. But we are going to bump it whenever we are. Um, adding the mouse move. So this will be a little bit more complicated than I was hoping it would be. Let's see. So event.coalesced event count is input event queue tail get queued mouse event dot coalesced event count plus one. Yeah. Okay, so then we remember how many of those we had, and here, um, we need to report back. Wait, what does this say, report? Event was handled. Hmm. So I guess all of the coalesced ones were not handled, but this one was. So this is gonna be pretty ugly. <laughs> Actually, um, I'll just do it this way. Uh, so we'll say that all those other mouse moves were handled. Call list event count. Report. Note. Um, note if I have to... Um, Notify the uh, our client about coalesced mouse moves. Um, so we do that by saying none of them were handled by the engine by the web page. Yes, and then. We do the mouse. Yeah, this is not ideal. Obviously, like this will create more IPC traffic than necessary, but I don't think it's a huge issue. Um, there's room for optimization here. Like you could, um, you know, add a, improve the API so that it, it has like a coalescing counter or something as part of the um, IPC API process input event queue. Oh, dang it. Did I not rename that? I only updated the call, but not the function. 
thought it built. I thought it built. Okay. Okay, so here's my fix up and then these fellas. Yeah, I want to stage that hunk. Web content. Um, coalesce mouse, um, multiple sequential mouse move events. Um, this this avoids spending um, this 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 let's see um, yeah this this can avoid uh, getting into a situation where lots of mouse move events are queued up and we have to and they all trigger relay out, so we have to wait a long time for them to get processed. Um, trigger relay out, or something else that takes a lot of time. This, 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 this. Um, yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, doo -doo -doo. Yeah, to make sure that we don't get out of sync with the um, input events queue on the UI process side. We still send acknowledgement for uh, coalesced mouse moves. There's room for improvement here. Um, my Discord uh, <laughs> friends list is now uh, very uh, pleasantly responsive. All right, that is pretty sweet. Let's see that it works uh, on the live site as well. So I'll have to log in once more. And let me get a Secret password. Do not steal. Oh, yeah. That is real nice. I mean, it's not perfect, but it's so much better than before. Hmm. Yeah, we can definitely make layout even faster. Like it shouldn't need to take um, almost 50 milliseconds to do this layout. Like for sure we can do, we, we should be able to cut that in half and, and that in half and so on. But we shaved off two thirds today. So I am pleased with that. And this is fantastic. And oh, right, I wanted to, um, do a profile with these changes. Also, I had a um, fix up commit. Let me let me not forget to actually do the fix up, and then let me apply my Colgrin patch. We can do another Colgrin, Colgrind, Colgrin profile. Uh, okay, come on now. Okay, so we load this up. 
and I'm going to turn on the instrumentation here in a moment. Just wait for it to load up. Mm -hmm. Okay. <laughs> it's definitely, definitely slower when you're running it in call grind, obviously, because it does emulate the CPU. Um, it would be real cool if you could get it so fast that it's even responsive while profiling like this. That would be awesome. But uh, that's not quite where we are today. Oh, it finished running actually. Okay, so where did we end up? Click clack. Update layout, 72% in layout. So it's still very layout heavy, um, which is good. I mean, the thing that we are doing is we're doing relayout. Um, so it's good that that is um, what we're doing and not some other nonsense. Paint, ooh, paint is here too, actually. Paint, but paint has to update the layout, right. Yeah, that wasn't really happening before because all the layouts um, happened in response to the mouse moves. But now that we do a paint, you end up painting and you have um, an invalid layout. So you have to lay out before you can paint. And that makes sense. And yeah, now we have style resolution 20%. Probably stuff we can do to improve that. Pseudo elements. Oh, those dang pseudo elements. Hmm. Anyways, we made some really, really good improvements today to responsiveness. So I am super happy with that. And I think I'm going to leave all of this fun for the future. Uh, so uh, I think this will be the end of the video. If you made it here, thank you so much for watching for hanging out. I hope that you saw something interesting today. And um, maybe if you thought of a way that we could get even better performance, I would be very interested to hear that. Um, and I should I should have un undid my um, patches there. Just wanted to look at it one last time. But yeah, maybe you, if you had a, an idea for something that could make this go even faster, you know that we are an open source project and contributions are always welcome. Um, but yeah, this is awesome. I'm really, really happy with this. And it's good to be working on Discord again. I think this, this was an important improvement to make because um, it was a bit unbearable before and a bit unbearable and a bit embarrassing. And like, <laughs> you need to you can't focus too much on performance too early, but if things have are unbearably slow, you do have to do something about it. And I think we're out of the unbearably slow swamp now, and we can start to look at um, functionality and fidelity and, and so on instead. Anyways, that's the end of the video. Thank you so much for watching. Uh, I will see you all next time. Bye.